Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, talk series. It's probably going to be two talks. Um, and uh, this is on spherical astronomy of stars and deep sky objects. Uh, spherical astronomy, also known as positional astronomy, is the is the field of calculating the locations of uh, stars and uh, planets and deep sky objects and so on. Uh, we will focus only on stars and deep sky objects because they are simpler. Uh, the orbital mechanics is not there. Um, and uh, if we can get someone that is, if someone in the audience or someone in BAS has uh, uh, expertise in calculating positions of planets, that will be a good follow-up session to this. So I won't be touching up on planets or the sun or the moon. Uh, partly because I don't know how to do these calculations and partly because they're much more complicated than uh, than what we will present here. Um, so the end goal of this pair of talks is that you can you will be able to calculate the position of a star or deep sky object to a decent precision, uh, like uh, within arc minutes, uh, from its catalog coordinates. Uh, so normally in a catalog, you will find what is called the J2000 or ICRS uh, RA and DEC, these are the coordinates that are uh, given to you in a catalog. Uh, and depending on your location on the Earth and the time of the day and the date that you are observing, uh, the star will be at a certain position. And the end, end goal of this pair of tasks is to give you all the tools to calculate this. Um, the prerequisites for this pair of talks is going to be uh, a functional knowledge of algebra and trigonometry. You don't have to know in depth of uh, calculus or the like, but uh, you should be able to, um, uh, you, you should have some familiarity with the trigonometric functions and uh, uh, how to plug them into a calculator or a computer program and uh, calculate some things. Uh, and ha also have a basic understanding of astronomy, like uh, when I say Polaris is the pole star, so on and so forth. Uh, that should be that, that kind of understanding should be there, and what is horizon, what is Venus, so on. Um, and like I said, we won't cover the positions of planets or solar system objects because it's much more complicated, uh, and I don't know how to do those calculations yet. Uh, I must also say uh, I am not an expert in this field. Uh, in fact. Part of my motivation for giving these uh, talks was to learn everything. So I actually learned a lot just for uh, this pair of uh, uh, talks. Uh, my only experience with this in the past has been that I've written some software. Uh, you might have uh, seen my DSS rotation tools, uh, which I advertised in the deep sky observing part of the talks. Uh, so also I've uh, contributed to this planetarium software called KSTAR. Uh, and, uh, so I'm I'm some I've somehow somehow used these formulas, but uh, I had never understood them uh, fully, and now I kind of understand them at let's say eighty percent or so. Uh, so that's my background in this field. I'm not uh, an expert, and uh, if if you know something or you find a mistake in my slides, uh, please feel free to correct me. Um, this also means I might not be able to answer everyone's questions. <laughs> so uh, we just go with uh, 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 whatever we can. A uh, few more things that I want to set up. Uh, so as you know, I did my PhD in America, and uh, it involved a lot of math. So I picked up a few Americanisms for calculation, and that's how I, that's the language that I use a lot now. Uh, so I might say Z instead of Z. I think that's the most obvious one. Uh, and I might say two over three for two by three, the fraction two by three. Uh, you know, in America, they tend to use over everywhere. So if I say one over uh, cosine of delta or whatever, I mean one divided by cosine delta. So I just want to clarify that uh, terminology that comes from this hemisphere. Uh, so uh, let me get started. Uh, this is my outline uh, for this talk especially. Uh, there are going to be introductory topics which are light on math this time. Uh, and uh, we are going to cover uh, units for angle measurement in astronomy, uh, the calendar system that we use and time measurement. Uh, we will talk about the celestial sphere, the celestial poles, celestial equator, horizon. Uh, and then we'll get into what's called the horizontal coordinate system. That's also known as altazimuth coordinates, right? Uh, uh, you might have heard of it in terms of altazimuth mount for the telescope or 
spawn and so forth. Uh, it's a simple coordinate system that is based on the observer's location and what the observer sees. Uh, then we'll introduce this concept called air mass and uh, we'll talk about atmospheric refraction correction. Um, and then uh, there's going to be a topic on ecliptic and the equinoxes um, and also the solstices. Uh, and uh, ecliptic is the plane of the solar system and we'll see how what it's like when projected. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about ecliptic and the equinoxes, and then we'll introduce the equatorial coordinate system, which is RA and X. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about hour angle and sidereal time, uh, and uh, talk about what the rotation of the Earth does to the stars. Right uh, now, uh, most of this is setting up the groundwork for the next talk, where we will actually present the formulas and the calculations that one actually needs to do. So there's not going to be as much cal calculation in this talk, but it's very concept heavy. Um, the next section is going to be more mathematics heavy, more formulae. Uh, and that's where we will get to the main topics where we'll actually calculate or give the algorithms to calculate uh, um, the all, all the calculations I promised, which is to find the position of a star or a deep sky object. Uh, so we'll talk about Julian day and calculation of local sidereal time. Julian day is a time measurement system we use in astronomy and uh, so is local sidereal time. Uh, and uh, then we'll talk about spherical trigonometry, which is the study of uh, triangles on the surface of a sphere uh, and uh, their solution. And that uh, the solution of the spherical triangle, uh, that formula that we get, is uh, applied for various calculations in astronomy. For example, we will apply it to get the north angle at a given altitude and azimuth. So for any point in the sky, which way is north, right? What is the angle that north makes with the vertical? We'll calculate that. Uh, then we'll go to the main application, which is to convert equatorial to horizontal coordinates. Because what you get in a catalog of stars is equatorial coordinates. And you have to convert it to horizontal coordinates to figure out where the star is in your sky. Uh, finally, we'll talk about precession and give the formulae for precession. And then uh, there are a few other effects that uh, affect the accuracy of these calculations, like mutation and uh, aberration and so on and so forth. I don't fully understand these effects. I'm, I'm just going to mention them and what they are at the base level uh, without any uh, presenting any calculations. These are usually not necessary for amateur astronomers uh, because they are uh, not very significant. Uh, but uh, uh, the primary reference for all of this material is uh, is a book. Uh, actually, I forgot to write down the reference, so let me actually put it here. Reference is a book called Astronomical Algorithms by uh, Jean Mears. Astronomical Algorithms. It's available from Wilman Bell Publishers. Okay, Jean Mears. The problem with this book is, uh, in my opinion, is that it's um, it's not very explanatory. It's more about how to calculate and so on and so forth. And uh, I feel it's very light on the explanation. So what I've tried to do in this talk series is I've uh, tried to uh, study Wikipedia, study this book, and uh, try to combine the information to get a more uh, conceptual presentation of this specific uh, flow of uh, topics. Uh, but that's the primary ref uh, reference. Uh, there is also another deeper reference that I haven't managed to open yet, and that's called the Explanatory Supplement to the Astronomical Almanac. It's a professional astronomer's publication. I don't know, I think by the US Naval Observatory. Uh, and uh, I'm told that that is a more comprehensive guide, but I've, I haven't actually looked at it yet. Uh, the uh, one more topic uh, talk before we begin, I want to say um, the way to approach these topics is that uh, while while we are going through the talk, you might only get 80% of the understanding, right? Because some of these are comp uh, have complicated geometry and, uh, it, you know, it uh, needs a lot of spatial visualization and so on and so forth. So even if you don't understand all of it, in the talk, my recommendation is uh, go back and think about it and uh, look at the night sky and try to get an intuition for this. And eventually it will become clear. So I, I would say you might get 
70 to 80 percent of your learning from the stock, but then the remaining 20 percent or 30 percent you will have to do on your own to try and understand. Uh, so it's kind of like a lecture in mathematics at the college, right? <laughs> so, and because I am not a deep expert in this topic, I am not uh, also in a position to explain it very well. Uh, I'll try to do my best. Okay. Uh, let me get started. I'll pause for questions in a in a few slides. Um, so let's start by talking about units for angle measurement in astronomy. Um, the most common way to measure an angle is degrees. Everyone understands what degrees is. 90 degrees is the right angle, right? And uh, there are uh, uh, 360 degrees in the full circle. Uh, you are probably also familiar with radians. Uh, from mathematics class. Uh, radians are uh, another unit of angle measurement, which is more natural to plug into trigonometric functions. Uh, we will use radians. I mean, uh, you need to know radians mostly only because when you actually write this in into software or you plug it into a calculator that's not set in uh, degree mode, you will have to first convert the angle to radian before, uh, before putting it into the calculator. Uh, or into the computer. That's the only reason we use radian. So even if you don't know what a radian means, it's uh, it's okay for this series of talks. Uh, so the right angle is pi divided by two radians, and the full circle is two pi radians. Um, but not so common are these uh, these angle measurements. Uh, what is called an arc minute is one sixtieth of a degree is called an arc minute, and one over three six hundred of a degree is called uh, um, an arc second. So normally in astronomy and even otherwise, uh, arc minute is denoted by single tick and arc second is denoted by double tick. Like the same uh, notation used for feet and inches is also used for arc minutes and arc seconds. Uh, but it will be usually obvious because uh, you will also put the degree sign. Uh, so, uh, so you will always write an angle like this. Uh, so it'll usually be obvious what you're talking about. Sometimes you'll just write arc minutes and then it, it should be clear from context. Uh, so this is just a system that is used. Uh, so, and sometimes you will see angles denoted in this format, which we call degree minute second format. Okay, uh, or a DMS format. Uh, and uh, this we will call as the decimal degrees format. So to convert between the two, all you have to do is uh, take your arc minutes and divide by 60, take the arc seconds and divide it, by, divide it by 3,600, and then add them up, and then you get the decimal degree. So in this example here, 15 degrees, 30 minutes, and 45 seconds translates to uh, this number, 15.5125 degrees. Um, now, there is another peculiar unit of measurement uh, used in uh, astronomy called hours. Uh, an hour is a measurement of angle that is roughly based on the fact that the Earth rotates 360 degrees in 24 hours. Now, the Earth does not always rotate 360 degrees in 24 hours. It, there is a little bit of variation in all of that. We'll talk about it. Uh, but when used as an angle measurement, one hour is exactly 15 degrees. That's the definition of an hour. Um, and similarly, there is a subdivision of hour called minute, and there's a subdivision of hour called second, and it follows the same pattern or as time. Uh, one minute is one sixtieth of an hour, and one second is one over three thirty six hundred of an hour. Uh, so same like arc minute and arc second. So uh, an angle denoted in hour minutes and seconds is shown here. This is the hour minute seconds. The same uh, word minute and second and hour also means time measurements as well as angle measurements in astronomy. Uh, so one has to be a little bit careful. Um, so an hour that is uh, an angle that is measured in hour, minute, seconds can be converted to degrees by doing the same thing, which is you take the 15, which is the hour, and add 30 divided by 60, which is the minute, and you divide the seconds by uh, 3600, and then you add all of this. And finally, this will give you uh, decimal hours, which is something that we almost never use in astronomy. Uh, you have to multiply it by 15 uh, to get the degrees. So 15 hours, 30 minutes, and 45 seconds, this angle corresponds to uh, 232.6875 degrees. So now it has been converted into 
the same format decimal degrees so this is we are converting hours minutes and seconds to decimal degrees here okay so uh, this is something you will see quite a lot uh, this hour minute second format that's peculiar to astronomy uh now we have told you how to measure angles uh, i'll now go over some very quick thumb rules on how to calculate uh, how the earth rotates and revolves around the sun in time okay so these numbers will uh, most amateur astronomers know these numbers uh, but uh, i'm going to rehash it since they keep coming up for approximate estimates all over uh, so the earth rotates 360 degrees in 24 hours uh if you do this calculation it turns out to be 15 degrees in 1 hour that's where the angle measurement of 1 uh, 1 hour comes right uh but now we are talking about time measurement of 1 hour 15 degrees in 1 hour of time uh and if you calculate further this means that the uh, sky rotates or the earth rotates uh, depending on your reference frame 1 degree in 4 minutes so you can think If a star on the celestial equator moves about one degree in four minutes, we'll define what the celestial equator is later. Uh, but one degree is four minutes. This is a uh, thumb rule that's uh, used uh, in astronomy a lot. Now, where might you have come across this thumb rule? Uh, you might have seen it when measuring the field of view of an eyepiece. So one of the ways to measure the field of view of an eyepiece is uh, that you take a star on the celestial equator, point to it, place it at one corner of your eyepiece. and let it drift to the other corner and then you time it and uh, then use this calculation 1 degree is 4 minutes to convert to find the field of view of your ip right you so many of you would have done that so that's where you use this calculation um less common is earth revolves 360 degrees in 365 days okay we are going to approximate this to 360 degrees in 360 days okay so just to calculate this is an approximation uh so that means the earth approximately revolves around the sun 1 degree per day okay so 30 degrees in a month because a typical month has 30 days or that's also two hours of angle uh because one hour of angle is 15 degrees so one month is roughly two hours of angle this is again a useful conversion uh this means for example the zodiacal constellation Are, are spaced uh, two hours apart, so the distance between Aries and uh, the subsequent one uh, is it Aquarius? <laughs> I don't know my zodiac, but uh, uh, yeah, for example, between Sagittarius and Capricorn, the rough difference is uh, two hours of uh, uh, of uh, of angle. That's thirty degrees. Uh, so the other way to think about it is if there's a star that is high up in the sky on the celestial equator and on the meridian we'll define these terms again uh, uh approximately overhead let's say we have a star that's approximately overhead uh and that star is at uh on, uh and this is at 1st january 8 pm let's say the star is overhead then it will be 30 degrees west on 1st february 8 pm because one month is about 30 degrees So uh, these are good thumb rules to do some quick calculation uh, for rotation and revolution. Uh, so before I get into calendars, I'll take any quick questions. Uh, I, I want to finish the talk as uh, you know within the time span. So I'd appreciate if we could mostly keep it to clarification. Are there any clarifications needed at this point? Akash, I don't see any uh, questions on the chat. Uh, perhaps some of the uh, members want to speak directly. They can. Okay. Let's give it another minute. Okay, I guess there aren't any questions. Uh, yeah, I think you can continue. Okay. Uh, so now we will introduce two calendar systems. Uh, we unfortunately need the older calendar uh, because it comes up later in our calculations. Astronomy tends to use this Julian day concept, so that's why I'm introducing this older Julian calendar. Uh, the calendar we use today is called the Gregorian calendar. Uh, 
in this, the, the reason we have these weird calendar systems is because one year is not exactly 365 days, right? This is why we have deep years, you know that, but uh, one year is actually uh, 365.24219 days. It's just number. Uh, I got this from Wikipedia. Uh, hopefully it's correct. <laughs> uh, uh, what we define as a year here is the cycle of seasons associated with revolution. And what we define here as a day is a, a repeated rising and setting of the sun as defined by the rotation of Earth. Uh, and the period is not exactly 365 days. It's this funny number, right? Uh, this means that if you treat one year as a 365 days in a calendar, then eventually uh, the date of uh, the solstice and the equinox will keep shifting, right? Because uh, you're not counting it correctly. Um, so uh, the calendar created by Julius Caesar, Julian calendar, uh, assumes that one year is 365.25 days, which is a good approximation to this, uh, right? So it assumes that a year is 365.25 days. And that's why in that calendar, every year has 365 days, except for every fourth year, which is a leap year. And all that leap year has 366 days. So now, because of that extra day every four years, you get the extra 0.25 days. So the average year in the Julian calendar has 365.25 days. But what happened is over the centuries, this number is not still a good approximation for this, 24219. So uh, somewhere in 1582 AD, uh, there was uh, this uh, Saint Gregory, I think, uh, or uh, he brought in a new calend calendar uh, where he brought in two changes. One is uh, now it approximates the 24219 better with this number. It approximates this as 2425 days. And the way it does this is it split up as follows. Every normal year is 365 days. Every fourth year, which is a leap year, is, a th is 366 days, except century years like uh, 1900 for example and 1800 actually even though they are uh, divisible by four they uh, they only had 365 days right so that's the, this rule every hundredth year is 365 days but if you remember 2000 was a leap year uh, every 400 year still has 366 days so based on this set of rules uh, we get the average year is now 365.2425 days long uh, that was the first change. The second change is because the Julian calendar had been used for many centuries, it had accumulated this error because of adding these uh, additional leap years that should not have been there. So what they did is after 4th October 1582, they made the next day 15th October uh, 1582. Uh, so suddenly they skipped 10 days. Um, and uh, And then uh that historically fixed the um the uh, the problems with the julian calendar now <laughs> this the way this becomes relevant is eventually we are going to calculate this thing called julian days and uh, the formula changes depending on uh, the gregorian calendar so when we when we use the cal gregorian calendar we have to account for all of this and the formula will incorporate this and so i'm just explaining that these effects are there Okay, so that's the Gregorian calendar that we follow today. Okay, let's talk about time measurement. We have talked about calendars. Uh, the time we measure for our everyday activities is called mean solar time. That's the, uh, that's the definition of this time. Uh, in, this, uh, in this system, it's based on tracking uh, the meridian transits of the sun. Now, the what we mean by meridian transit is the highest point that the sun goes to in a day, right? Uh, uh, that's that's what we call the meridian transit, when the sun is as high overhead as possible. Um, and uh, we define uh, the successive meridian transit. So let's say that there is a meridian trans transit today at some time, and uh, the next meridian transit the next day, uh, we measure that interval and we call that a day. Uh, we call that a solar day. The problem is uh, the sun has uh, different rates of east to west motions as seen from the Earth. So it's not 
this time period is not constant over the year so what they do is they average this time period over the year and that's what we define as one day so this way the one day notion doesn't change over the year uh become more and less over the year even though the arrival of the sun uh happens at different times um uh i'll just mention this uh, ajay brought to my attention uh, that even though the summer solstice was actually uh, june 22nd or whatever right uh, the day of the latest sunset when the sun sets the uh, latest time in the day uh, that happens on uh, apparently june 30th this year in most of the northern hemisphere so or uh, so that is actually because of the fact that the day length of the day changes uh, but we always assume uh, that we we average out those variations and take the only the um, mean solar day that's why the word mean is there here okay if this is too complicated don't worry about it uh, it took me quite a while to get this concept uh, but i'm just trying to explain what these uh, why we call it mean solar time okay so there's a lot of intricacy to this you might have to think about it uh, back at home to fully understand it uh so this is the time we measure but there is one more effect uh that causes changes in our uh, notion of what a day is and that is you might have heard that the earth's rotation speed is slowing down right because of the interactions of with the moon and so on and so forth uh so in fact it's not slowing down constantly it it goes up and down so there is variation in the earth's rotation speed it's not uh uniform and uh this notion of mean solar time actually tracks this variation because it is based on the rotation of the earth so that means that one day is not always 86400 seconds in instead sometimes the one day is actually 86401 seconds they add this thing called a leap second every now and then uh to account for the slowing down of the earth uh again this is some really complicated uh, time keeping stuff uh the only time that this becomes important is uh uh when calculating ephemeris of planets and so on and so forth if you want high accuracy ephemeris then uh you should remember that the time that we measure is actually not uniform in the sense that the notion of a day changes with time right it's sometimes 86400 seconds sometimes it is 86401 seconds so instead astronomers use this thing called dynamic time that is uniform that is unaffected by the variation of uh, uh the uh, variation of the earth's rotation speed so uh, if you if you like to think about it this way uh this mean solar time is defined by rotation of earth so it is related to of, of rotation of the earth and this time is just what is measured by atomic clocks so as uh, our as our clocks get more and more accurate we have to uh, distinguish between these things okay uh so again this uh, these details are not important for the actual calculations that we are going to do in the next session i'm just uh, adding them to be complete uh to give a more complete presentation uh now let's talk about time zones now this is something that most of us have experienced with uh there is a standard world time that tracks this mean solar time right and that's called utc uh the way they define utc is that they uh, measure the positions of various quasars uh and uh, th that way they measure the exact rate of rotation of the earth and then they adjust utc to be within 0.9 uh, within 1 second of that by adding this leap second business so utc uh is uh, is the best approximation we use for this mean solar time and for practical purposes this is the same as gmt greenwich mean time that we all have uh, studied growing up uh, gmt is a time zone utc is a standard time uh, so it's just uh, some textbook difference okay uh, it's uh, th but they mean one and the same thing as far as uh, we are concerned um and every time zone has a utc offset uh, we know this for example india is utc plus 5 uh, five and a half hours so whatever is the time in greenwich if it's the time in greenwich greenwich is 12 pm then the time in india is 5:30 pm so we all know this and we are familiar with this and uh, in america there are maybe four or five time zones i don't 
know exactly i think five uh the interesting thing is in europe and in america and in a lot of parts of the world they have this thing called daylight savings uh so depending on whether it's summer or winter we change the utc offset uh so right now my utc offset is utc minus 7 uh in california in the summer uh so the first step in almost any astronomical calculation is to convert your time whatever it is to utc right uh and we do that by accounting for this offset so in india you would subtract 5 and 1/2 hours from whatever is your local time and get it to utc so astronomers always tend to measure time in utc now time zones are a convenience uh the reality is uh for example if the sun is overhead at 12 pm on a certain day uh i think that happens on vernal equinox right so uh if the sun is supposed to be overhead at noon uh it will only be overhead in uh on the time zone defining city which uh for india is mirzapur it will only be overhead in mirzapur at 12 pm right because 12 pm is uh, defined in india based on this the, based on the longitude of mirzapur okay so if you are actually in uh, like west of india like gujarat uh the time uh, time that you are supposed to follow is actually ist minus 50 minutes so the time actually depends on your the exact time that you are going to see depends on your longitude uh but uh but for convenience we just use time zones so the time that depends on your longitude is called the local mean time and if you want to calculate local mean time you uh take utc and add to it your longitude in degrees but divided by 15 because 1 degree is uh sorry 15 degrees is 1 hour right uh so uh this is how you calculate the local mean time for your uh longitude but the the problem is if everyone every city has a different time we will all go crazy that's why we follow time zone uh now again this is not very relevant for the calculations we are going to do because we will handle the longitude in the formulas differently but this is good to know that means uh, if uh, aries is overhead in uh, chennai at uh, 8 pm then aries will uh, be overhead in uh, uh, or aries would have been overhead earlier in uh, with earlier no aries will be overhead later in bangalore by a few minutes right so that's uh, that's important to keep in mind okay uh so before i get into this uh, topic is there any questions on uh, uh, on the concepts that we have just discussed on time and calendar hey, uh, there there is one question so yes. why is linear take, uh, taken into consideration uh, in that one of the uh, calculation before uh, why was uh, could you say could you repeat that again i had some interference i couldn't hear you ha huh, so uh, it says why leap year uh, was taken into consideration uh, in in uh, one of your previous slides you mentioned about the leap year leap years okay yeah. got it uh, so leap years are uh, important because the if if you say uh, okay so to measure how the i uh, earth changes or sorry to measure how the sky changes uh in, in the positions of the stars changes we want to have some running count of time that uh, tracks every rotation of the earth systematically right because the rotation of the earth is the primary contributor to the change in the sky uh so uh if we don't include leap year then we will keep undercounting uh, uh sorry i'm not being very clear let me see if i can explain this better so if we want to keep a running count of days then it's important to add that extra day because of leap years right so for example if i'm in 2009 uh and i wanted to calculate the position of some star i should know that 2008 is a leap year 2004 is a leap year and 2000 is a leap year and so on and so forth from whatever time i started all of this calculation so i need a running count of days and to convert my calendar day to a running count of days we have to consider leap year that's the only reason 
So if I had okay. a running count of days, I would not need leap years uh, to be accounted for in the calculations. But because I use the regular Gregorian calendar, and if we want to convert a Gregorian calendar date to a running count of days, which we will do in the next uh, session, uh, then we need to account for the leap year. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, uh, it it should. Uh, and uh, Ajay wants to show a picture of uh, Analemma, uh, if it is fine. Uh, no, I I do not fully understand Analemma uh, because, like I said, uh, it, it's a slightly more complicated uh, thing when it involves the sun, moon, or planet. So I'm going to try and restrict myself to deep sky. Uh, but if you want to, if you want a quick explanation of uh, uh, the, I can explain the east-west movement in the NLM or like the north-south movement in the NLM, right? That's just the fact that the ecliptic plane, which is the plane of the solar system, is uh, tilted by 23 and a half degrees from the rotation of the Earth, right? So uh, as seen from the Earth, the sun moves, uh, seems to move north and south. That's what we call in India Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. So that's the north-south part of the NLM. The east-west part, I'm actually not clear. I haven't thought about it enough. Okay. Maybe Ajay has an answer. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, probably Ajay, uh, can we can we uh, look at the image at the uh, end of the session? End of the session, okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, there is one. Uh, why why there is two time zones in California? If you are aware. Uh, it's it's just historic. <laughs> there is no good reason for it. Uh, so it's it, so that in the summer months we enjoy more sunlight in the evening or something like that. It's a uh, it's a historic uh, thing created by Benjamin Franklin, and uh, uh, a lot of lot of America and a lot of Europe follows this uh, two time zone system. But at any given time, there is only one time zone. In the summer, we switch uh, from summer to winter. We actually switch the time zone. Uh, so we adjust our clocks and uh, every summer and every winter uh, or rather spring and fall. Uh, so this is a historical thing and now we are stuck with it. Okay. Um, there's one more question. Even I need some clarification. Uh, Shaktiwal, sir, can you uh, explain that uh, you just mentioned equation of time? Uh, I did not get the full context of that. Sorry, what is, what is the equation of time? Uh, yeah. No, I didn't, I didn't call anything equation of time. Are we talking about the previous slide, the local mean time, this thing? Uh, I guess so. Even I'm not clear on that question. So, uh, Mr. Shaktivel, sir, uh, can you explain uh, the question? Oh, yes, there is an equation called equation of time, but I'm not familiar with what it is. Uh... Hi, uh, this is Kirti. So I think yeah. uh, if you are using a sundial to measure the time, yeah. uh, then uh, so there ah. will be some deviation uh, okay. in the time. In, so it looks like some kind of a sine wave. So that's the equation of time. I, I had seen this in Planetarium uh, in one of their exhibits, but I also don't remember this uh, completely. Hi, this is Prabhu. Equation of time is the actually the uh, east-west movement of the animal. The one that uh, you were talking about. Probably Ajay Talwar will explain better. Uh, so I uh, thank you, Kirti. I think your explanation is correct. Okay, so I just looked at uh, my reference for uh, what is the equation of time. Uh, this is in John Mears uh, chapter 28. Uh, it says that the equation of time is the difference between apparent and mean solar time. So it, it captures, uh, yeah, okay, now I understand what the equation of time is. The equation of time is something that calculates this difference that I just described, right? The fact that every day does not have the same, uh, every day as measured by subsequent meridian transits of the sun does not have the same length. And so there's a difference between mean solar time and uh, the apparent solar time. This is, this is called the apparent solar time the actual time measured by meridian transits of the sun. Uh, and that difference is uh, called the equation of time. 
uh, unfortunately, like I said, I don't have a very good understanding of this variation, and uh, I, I won't go over it. Uh, but you can look at uh, Jean Mears's book, and if you want, I can send you a photograph of that uh, chapter. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I think the uh, questions for this time are that's all. We can continue. Okay, great. Uh, so let's now talk about the celestial sphere. Uh, as seen from Earth, all the celestial objects, they appear to lie on a sphere that we call the celestial sphere. Uh, the reason to think about it this way is that our eyes cannot estimate the distance to stars, right? We know this, for example, that all the, if viewed in 3D, the stars of any constellation, they are, uh, they are separated in the third dimension in distance from us but we view them as if they were flat because our eyes cannot estimate the actual distance to these stars or even any of our instruments, you know, unless you do like very long baseline parallax. Uh, so, uh, so because of this, we imagine that all the stars are fixed on a sphere that we call the celestial sphere. Uh, one way to think about it is, uh, Imagine another sphere, a big sphere of uh, large radius or undefined radius, really, uh, surrounding the Earth. Uh, and the stars are sitting on that sphere. Uh, and uh, now we know the points on the Earth, the important points on the Earth are like North Pole, South Pole, and the equator, right? These are the important points on our Earth if we ignore like Tropic of Cancer and so on and so forth. Uh, so I have drawn the Earth with an axial tilt, like uh, like you see it in many pictures. It's, it's, I've drawn it kind of in the plane of the solar system, right? So where this uh, uh, where the axis of rotation of the Earth is tilted. So this line here is the axis of rotation of the Earth, and the North Pole and South Pole are the end points of this axis on the Earth. Now imagine you are standing at the North Pole. The point that is vertically above you uh, in the sky, we call that point the North Celestial Pole. And similarly, if you're standing at the South Pole, uh, the point that is vertically above you in the sky, we call that the South Celestial Pole. So this is how, uh, we, so we, what we do is we project the points that are on the Earth onto the celestial sphere. That way we get the North Celestial Pole and the South Celestial Pole in the sky, okay? Uh, the North Celestial Pole is an extension of the North Pole onto the Celestial Sphere. The uh, South Celestial Pole is the extension or projection of the South Pole onto the, south, uh, onto the Celestial Sphere. Similarly, you can imagine standing at various points on the equator and looking what is right above your head and marking all of those points on the Celestial Sphere. That line that you get by projecting the equator onto the Celestial Sphere, that we call the Celestial Equator, this blue line here. Okay, so. Uh, if this is all confusing for any reason, just imagine drawing rays from the center of the Earth. Uh, because we cannot measure distance, what we can only do is tell you which way the ray is going, not how far it is going, right? And any star that crosses that ray or any point that touches that ray, we mark as uh, being having the same coordinates uh, as, uh, as you know, or that's the point that we mark on the celestial sphere. Right, the celestial sphere is not a real sphere. It's actually a, just a collection of rays. Uh, but uh, whatever is, it, it, I, at least when I was first introduced to the celestial sphere, it, sphere, it was very confusing for me. Uh, but if I think of it as a collection of rays, it becomes more clear because this there's no actual sphere and it doesn't have a defined radius. So if if I may. If, to be more precise, the North Celestial Pole is the ray that goes through the North Pole into the sky. That's what we call the North Celestial Pole. And similarly, the South Celestial Pole is the ray that uh, uh, that passes through the South Pole from the center of the Earth and goes into the sky. So that we are calling as the South Celestial Pole. Similarly, similarly the equation is the collection of all the rays that passes through the center of the Earth and the, and the equator on the Earth is when it in the sky, we call it the celestial equator. Uh, so uh, if, again, this is still hard to visualize, you know that the pole star stand, sits at the north celestial pole, so that gives you a very strong anchor of what the NCP is in the sky. That point is called the north celestial pole. And if you move 90 degrees from that, 
uh, towards the south then or any in any direction if you move 90 degrees from that then you get on to the celestial equator and then if you move another 90 degrees so you're opposite the north pole which is usually underground in the northern hemisphere uh, then you get a point that's called the south celestial pole uh, and remember at any given point on the earth only one half of the sphere is visible right because the other half is blocked by the ground uh, some technical details about altitude and so on but roughly one half of the sphere is visible okay let's get to the next topic uh so like i said because we don't know the radius of the sphere uh any point on this celestial sphere or any sphere for example uh can be described in terms of two angles uh right you can think of uh you can think of this as the spherical polar coordinates that you might have studied in math class uh or more simply you can think of it as altitude and azimuth so if you have a telescope on an altazimuth mount you first have to rotate it in the ground plane the azimuth axis to get to one position and then you need to lift the telescope in the altitude axis uh to get the position of the star right so there's two motions one horizontal motion that you have to do and then one vertical motion so i can specify for you for example how to point to a star by telling you how to move your hand left to right and then how to move your hand up to down right and that is that is two angles that i have to specify move your hand 30 degrees horizontally and then move it up by 15 degrees and then you are pointing to the star for example that uh that tells you that two ma two angles are enough to measure a point or to specify a point on the uh, on any sphere so normally uh, we call this angle that i've shown in the in the plane as the azimuthal angle and we call uh this angle uh, the altitude or altitude in a angle i'm going to call it Okay, so uh, so these are not always azimuth and altitude because this kind of coordinate system is used for e even equatorial coordinates have two angles uh, and so uh, more more simply there is one angle which I'm calling phi here that ranges from minus ninety degrees to plus ninety degrees which tells you how uh, your up down motion is what. Uh, what up down might what up and down means might change but uh, there is one angle that goes between minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees and then there is one more angle that goes between 0 and 360 degrees okay so this is how you usually uh, set up a coordinate system on a sphere and you need two reference points or two reference circles or two reference directions to uh, constitute uh, to construct such a coordinate system uh, in this example for example this is the phi uh, equals 90 de degrees direction and here's the theta equals 0 degrees direction so once i give you uh, these two directions uh, you can construct the coordinate system okay or i can give you this circle uh, which is which defines the plane of the azimuth angle so i can give you this plane and then i can give you uh, uh, I, i i guess yeah and then i have to give you some specific point on that plane to act as the origin uh, then then i have again constructed a uh, a coordinate system we'll see many examples i think this will become clear when we see examples so we need two reference points or two reference uh, two references to construct this coordinate system and we need two angles one running from minus 90 to 90 and the other running from 0 to 360 so one realization of this is uh, what we call what we call the geodetic coordinate system or latitude and longitude this is something we are all familiar with uh latitude is that uh, is that vertical coordinate that goes uh from minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees so 90 degrees south to 90 degrees north and the other coordinate is longitude which goes from 0 to 360 degrees right so this is just a realization of uh, of that same kind of coordinate system for the earth so any point in the earth can be given by altitude and sorry by uh, can be described by a latitude and a longitude very simple uh for the sky we use something very similar called right ascension and declination which we will cover later uh 
now, okay, before I get into this, are there any questions? Uh, no new questions. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's define what is a great circle. A great circle on a sphere is any circle whose center passes through the center of the sphere. Okay, so here I have drawn two circles. The orange circle is, called, is a great circle. Okay, and the uh, blue circle is not a great circle. Why? The, the center of the orange circle coincides with the center of the sphere. Okay, whereas the, the center of this circle, which is here, does not coincide with the center of the uh, sphere. So any circle that whose center coincides with the center of the sphere is called a great circle. Now, great circle on a sphere is a very important uh, kind of circle uh, because if you want to find the shortest distance between two points on a sphere, the, the great circle, the arc of the great circle that passes through these two points is the shortest distance. So that's why great circles are very important for navigation. Uh, in, in this sense, they are called geodesics. They are the geodesics on the sphere. Uh, so an example of the great a uh, great circle is the equator. The equator is a great circle. Um, uh, and things like the Arctic Circle, the Tropic of Cancer, these are not great circles because they don't their center actually lies uh, offset from the center of the Earth. Uh, whereas the equator, the center of the equator passes through the center of the Earth. So therefore, the equator is a great circle, but Arctic of Ar Arctic Circle, Tropic of Cancer, etc., are not. Okay, uh, so this will become important later. Uh, another important thing to note is that the radius of a great circle is equal to the radius of the sphere. And the radius of the great circle, I mean, the great circle has the biggest uh, circumference or biggest radius of any circle that you can construct on, on the sphere. For example, this circle has a shorter circumference than this great circle, right? Uh, so the great circle has a maximum circumference. Uh, now, uh, there was one thing, one more thing I wanted to say. Uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I remember what I wanted to say. So we are not going to consider. You know that the Earth is slightly elliptical. It's not perfectly spherical. Uh, it's slightly ellipsoidal and it's slightly flatter at the poles and bulged at the equator. We are not going to consider that in this uh, in these calculations at all. Astronomers do consider this, but uh, that is way beyond the scope of what we are doing here. So for our uh, for our series of talks, uh, the 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 Earth is a sphere. Okay. So what is the horizon? Okay. Uh, so the definition of horizon is uh, wherever you are, you imagine a tangent plane. There's a plane tangent to the Earth. You remember what a tangent is? It's the plane that touches the Earth at only one point. Uh, so there's a plane tangent to Earth uh, that you can imagine, and that is what is called the horizon. That's the uh, technical astronomy definition of horizon. And it makes sense because the part of the sky that you see is, is only the what is above that plane. Okay, I'm, I'm not done a very good job of drawing it here. And also the thing is, the this celestial sphere has an undefined radius. So this diagram will not look accurate. I have to draw it infinitely big to make it look accurate. So that's not possible. Uh, but this line is the horizon. And what is above the horizon can be seen. Uh, although it looks like less than half of a celestial sphere, half of the celestial sphere is above the horizon. So that's a problem of trying to draw something that is infinite in a finite space. Uh, so the horizon is basically the tangent plane uh, to where you are. And, uh, and an important uh, thing to note is that this, the latitude that you are at, so here's the observer. The observer has a latitude and a longitude, right, on the Earth's surface. Uh, the latitude is equal to the height of the pole, pole star. This is a very important concept that will come up again and again. So altitude of the North Celestial Pole, as seen by the observer, is equal to the latitude of the observer. And if you want to show this, the way you do it is as, as follows. So 
the latitude is this uh, coordinate that is perpendicular to the equator, right? It's measured up uh, north south on the Earth. So this angle uh, that I marked here, phi, is the latitude of the observer. Uh, here's a 90 degree angle, so between the Earth's axis and the equator uh, plane. Uh, so this angle is 90 degree minus phi, and this is a right angle because uh, a tangent to a circle uh, touch, uh, touches the, it makes a right angle to the radius, uh, or in other words, the tangent plane to the sphere makes a right angle with the radius of the sphere to that point. Uh, so since uh, since this is a ni uh, 90 degree angle, this uh, angle will be phi because the sum of angles, uh, sum of angles in a triangle should be 180 degrees. And then you use alternate angles, and this angle is uh, like th these two are lines that are intersecting. So the opposite angle is uh, uh, sorry, opposite angle is uh, is phi again. So the angle made by the north celestial pole to the horizon is equal to your latitude. Now uh, that was a kind of geometric derivation. Uh, if you don't want to think geometrically, you can also think as follows. If you are standing right at the equator, this plane is going to run uh, is going to run like this. Uh, and so the north pole will be, remember the circle actually has infinite radius. So anything parallel to it is also the north. So uh, the north pole uh, lies exactly on your horizon. And as you increase in latitude, uh, the north pole keeps coming up and at the north pole of the Earth, the north celestial pole is directly overhead. So that means its, la its altitude is equal to your latitude. Right? So that's uh, that's one other way to think about it. So for example, in Bangalore, you will see uh, the north pole is 13 degrees above the horizon. Uh, north, the pole star is 13 degrees above the horizon. Whereas for us, uh, the pole star here in California is about 38 degrees above the horizon. Okay, so that's uh, that. We'll keep coming back to this idea too. So uh, even if you didn't understand the derivation, remember this uh, punchline. Okay, now uh, now we are ready to introduce the horizontal coordinate system, also known as altazimuth coordinate. This is the natural coordinate system for the observer. Okay, when you go out and look at the sky, this is the coordinate system that you are thinking in terms of. The horizon in this coordinate system is your ground flat plane. Okay, this is the horizon, and the point vertically above you when you go and look at the sky is called the zenith. Now, let me go back and forth between these two slides. So what we are now doing is we are making this the up direction and this the uh, ground direction, okay? Or in other words, this will become our azimuthal angle. The angle in this plane, this orange plane, the horizon plane is the azimuthal angle. And the angle measure, measuring up and down as defined uh, like this is going to be the Altitudinal angle. So it's as if we took this entire thing and rotated it such that this plane became your ground. Okay. So this is what it looks on the Earth. This is what it looks for us standing on the Earth, right? Uh, so here's the North Celestial Pole. Remember, the North Celestial Pole has an altitude equal to your latitude. I'm going to stick to this uh, uh, convention. Phi is going to always represent the latitude in this series of talks. And H is going to represent altitude, and A is going to, capital A is going to represent azimuth. This is the standard notation in astronomy. Uh, so going back to how we construct these two angles uh, on in any coordinate system, uh, the ground angle is the azimuth angle, right? So. Uh, and the up-down angle is the altitudinal angle. So the altitudinal angle here is the altitude, and the azimuthal angle is the azimuth. Uh, and this, so this is what the uh, sky looks like in uh, in horizontal coordinates. So this is pretty natural. If you want to locate a star, let's say its altitude is 30 degrees and its azimuth is uh, 15 degrees. Uh, Oh, yeah, I should mention there are different conventions for measuring azimuth. In this series of talks, we will make zero degrees the, uh, of azimuth equal to north. Okay, the azimuth zero uh, is coincident with north. 
And azimuth increases towards the eastern direction. So the east has 90 degrees of azimuth, south has 180 degrees of azimuth, and uh, west has 270 degrees of azimuth. And 360 degrees is, of course, the same as zero degrees. Uh, so this is the convention that we are going to use for azimuth in this series of talks. Some people start their azimuths from the south and go eastwards. Some people start the azimuths from the north but go westwards. Uh, so it can be confusing. Uh, but in this talk, we will stick to this convention. So let's say I want to locate a star which has as altitude 15 degrees and azimuth 30 degrees. What I do is I start with my hand pointing towards north, uh, an extended arm pointing towards north. Then I move 30 degrees towards east along the ground. That is my azimuth change. And then I move my hand up towards the zenith 15 degrees. Right? Then I have located, I'm pointing to the location which is uh, given by these coordinates. So then I'm pointing to the star. So this is how the alt azimuth system works. Okay. Uh, the zenith has altitude equals 90 degrees. Any point on the horizon has altitude equals zero degrees. I think this should be obvious. What is the azimuth of the zenith? It is undefined. Okay, because if I, if I, if whichever azimuth I start from and go up to the zenith, the zenith is only one point. So the, uh, so the, uh, the azimuth of the zenith is undefined. And this is why, if you think about it, alt azimuth telescopes have a big problem at the, uh, at the zenith, right? That's why we never point it towards the zenith because the azimuth axis is very hard to move. Uh, it's very confusing. And uh, uh, in, in mathematical terms, you would call this as a coordinate singularity, right? The coordinate system has a problem there. Uh, and uh, in, in, for a Dobsonian telescope, we would call this region the Dobson's hole, uh, where we try to avoid observing. That's because the azimuth of the zenith is undefined. Okay, uh, again, this is a good point to pause for any uh, questions that, about the material that we just covered. Are there any questions? Hello. Yes. Uh, sir, can you please explain uh, this coordinate system once again? I'm a little bit confused. The the horizontal coordinate system? This yeah, yeah, this yeah, this one, this one. Yeah, OK. So uh, let's back up and say uh, the altazimuth coordinate system is the one that is most natural uh, to you when you are seeing the sky, OK? When you want to look at the position of a star in the sky, you think in terms of how much do I have to move my telescope left to right, and how much do I have to move it up to down? So that's what this coordinate system is based on. So the angle that's defined for, uh, so if I want to move my telescope from the north uh, uh, to, to a, uh, a star, then the angle that I have to move it left to right along the uh, ground, that angle is called the azimuth. And then the angle that I have to move it up down is called the altitude. Okay, because remember, I need two, two angles to define any point on the sphere. So to define the location of a star in the sky, I need two, two angles. And those two angles are this altitude and azimuth angles. So uh, the altitude is zero at, uh, at the horizon, uh, by definition, if you like. So. Anything below the horizon has negative altitude. Anything on the horizon has zero degrees altitude. And fully looking, if you are looking straight up with your neck, fully raised, like vertically up, that point we call the zenith, that point has 90 degrees altitude. Okay. Yes, yes sir. Uh, yes, sir. And the, the, azimuth, the azimuth coordinate has a different conventions, nobody uses the same convention, but in this and the next talk, we will always say that azimuth is zero degrees at north. So in the north direction, the azimuth is zero degrees. And uh, in east, it is 90 degrees. South, it is 180 degrees. And west, it is 270 degrees. So it increases going east. Okay, so, so it's zero at north. So just for example, the pole star, which comes at the north celestial pole, we know that its altitude is equal to the la latitude, right, of the location. So altitude is uh, phi, whatever is your latitude, that's the same as the altitude of the pole star. And the azimuth is zero degrees because it's at the north. 
Now, I, I, I should always mention uh, the pole star is actually not exactly at the North Pole. It's slightly offset. But we are going to pretend that it's exactly on the North Pole, but just for uh, discussion, to make it easier. Uh, so, so that's the basis of this coordinate system. Uh, I'm sorry, I've uh, again developed a little bit of the American pronunciation. If you didn't understand zenith, it's the same as what we would call zenith in India. Uh, we would probably pronounce altitude as altitude and uh, azimuth as azimuth. So, <laughs> I apologize. If that was not Okay, sir. What you have said that uh, pointing towards the north, our uh, our hand and turn it to 30 degrees, then 50 degrees. Uh, please explain that that only. Okay, so that's uh, that's a uh, that's an example. Let us. Uh, I'm I'm trying to describe how to locate a star that has altitude of uh, 15 degrees and azimuth of 30 degrees. So to locate a star with altitude 15 degrees and 30 degrees, one way you can think about doing it is you first point your telescope to the ground on the north side. Okay, you, uh, below the pole star, you point it to the ground. Uh, that will be your telescope now has altitude zero degrees and azimuth zero degrees. Then you move your telescope towards east mm -hmm. by 30 degrees. That, that will create the azimuth of 30 degrees, but altitude is still zero degrees because azimuth is uh, the left-right variation or in the ground variation. Then you lift your telescope by an angle of 15 degrees. That will give you, get you to altitude 15 degrees and azimuth 30 degrees. Now, and then you're looking at the star. So the example I was showing, this, this angle, this motion is the azimuth, that is 30 degrees. Then this motion is the altitude, which is 15 degrees, and that's how you can get to this star. This is just an example. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, any other questions? Yeah, Akash, uh, it's just an inference uh, that I am making. Uh, okay. All all the uh, coordinates, uh, altitude and azimuth, are all great circles. No, that's not correct. But uh, thank you for bringing up this point. Uh, okay. So, coordinates of fixed, um, always one of them is a great circle and the other is not. Uh, let me think for a moment. Here, the circles of fixed altitude are not great circles because this is the oh, right. uh, yes. this is the circle of uh, fixed altitude of let's say 60 degrees or whatever, right? This is the circle of fixed altitude. That's not a great circle. Whereas circles of fixed azimuth are great circles. Okay, what is the circle of fixed azimuth here? It's it's for example this circle that I've drawn that goes from north all the way to south horizon, right? Uh, that's a uh, uh, that's not exactly correct because it's only semicircles. Sorry, there are no circles of fixed azimuth. There are only semicircles. So this is okay. a semicircle of the fixed az azimuth of zero degrees, and that's part of a great circle. Correct. So the semicircles of azimuth, just like the semicircles of longitude on Earth, are semicircles that are half of great circles, whereas the circles of fixed altitude, just like the circles of fixed latitude. They are not great circles. Okay. Yes, I see your point. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Let me back up here just for everyone's convenience. So this is where we define latitude and longitude. For example, this is the circle of this is like the Arctic circle, circle of fixed latitude. That is not a great circle. Whereas, whereas this is some meridian. This is maybe like uh, some let's say it's 82 degrees west. Okay. Uh, that's uh, that's part of a great circle. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, uh, Hi, yes. One question. Uh, so, at the zenith, what do you consider the azimuth as? Uh, so, do you? I mean, if I want to point my telescope directly at zenith, so what should I type for azimuth? And you can type uh, if, if I'm okay, if I'm if I'm if I'm writing a software to track something in Altas, uh, so. Uh -huh. So will that not cause any problem uh, uh, in, in the in the software because azimuth is kind of it can be anything mm -hmm. at, at that yeah point. correct so it it should uh, so let's describe firstly if you if uh, if the azimuth of the zenith is zenith is undefined we already discussed that okay so no matter what azimuth you start with. Once you raise your altitude to 90 degrees, you are at the same zenith. 
so the uh, any azimuth that you punch into your uh, uh, into your telescope will take you to the zenith when the altitude is 90 degrees so that answers your first okay, question yeah. the second question this is only a coordinate singularity there is no actual problem happening there it's just that your coordinate system is bad so if you carefully do all your computation see you might encounter a uh, if in computer terms you might encounter a nan right there because you will get some zero by zero division or something and you will encounter nan uh, that is not a number uh, so as long as you are careful to handle that uh, you can always work around it i i don't know i, I guess okay. how to handle it specifically will yeah how to handle it specifically will de depend on your application but uh, you also realize that it is not practical for a like a dobsonian telescope or i guess a dobsonian will do it but it is not practical for a like a pier altas telescope to point up because it will hit the pier uh, so th there are those practical considerations also is that correct okay correct actually no no sorry that's not correct i i i i goofed up there there might be some telescope design where you actually hit the pier but uh, i guess in the standard uh, altas mounts i think you don't hit the pier similarly in a dobsonian you can actually point to that point so nothing actually is happening there you if if you handle all your coordinates correctly uh, you might have to handle that nan very carefully but uh, you can still work <laughs> it's just like asking what is the array of the north pole we have the same problem with right ascension right the array of the north pole is undefined yeah yeah okay right okay any other questions hey uh, there is one question wouldn't it be easier to use any angle for convenience yeah uh, good point uh, for uh, for what uh, specifically use any angle for what uh, i think it referred to the previous question what kirti was asking uh, there to dial in the uh, azimuth number in case of zenith so no zenith angle will still have the same problem so zenith has zenith angle 0 degrees but azimuth is still undefined it's a problem with the coordinate system if you just change over to zenith angle you won't uh, you, you won't solve this problem right but, uh, so for those who don't know what zenith angle is it will come up later uh, actually it's going to come up in my next slide zenith angle is just this angle it's 90 degrees minus the i guess this uh, figure has been abused too much it's zenith angle is just 90 degrees minus uh, uh, altitude okay so that's uh, the complementary right is that correct from my geometry the complementary angle this angle is called the zenith angle uh but yeah that doesn't that doesn't help solve this problem so here i have just shown the same altas coordinate system on the on on the standard chart that i have been showing you know the two reference point here are the zenith and uh and the north are the two reference points so uh and and uh, uh, azimuthal angle is the azimuth and the uh, altitude in a angle is the altitude right the azimuth is the angle in the plane and altitude is the angle perpendicular to that plane uh okay uh, any other questions oh uh, no i believe no. yeah okay so my next topic is atmospheric refraction uh and air mass okay so uh the amount of atmosphere that the starlight is going through actually depends on uh the altitude you are looking at okay so we will use this uh rather stupid approximation for the atmosphere uh, it's called the plane parallel approximation where the, this is the earth this is your horizon uh, i'm almost always using an orange line to signify horizon uh and let us say the atmosphere extends to uh some number i'm just going to make up some number 50000 kilometers okay this number might not even be real i'm just making up some number uh, actually i think that's over, way way over so let's say 50000 feet okay uh 
let's say their atmosphere extends to 50000 feet it's just one solid or like one gaseous thing that turns off magically at 50000 feet so this is the approximation we are going to use so all of this gray area is air uh, whatever i've shown here then what happens is if you are looking straight up at the zenith then the starlight is going through one of these atmospheres okay one atmosphere length whereas if you're looking at like let's say 45 degrees here then you are looking at not not just one atmosphere length you are looking at more than one atmosphere length it's this length that you are looking at the one that i've shaded in yellow right that's the amount of atmosphere that the starlight has gone through so if you do the trigonometry here this is a right angle okay and uh, this angle here is the zenithal distance what, what somebody mentioned uh this this blue angle which is a complementary angle to the altitude 90 degrees minus altitude is called the zenithal distance uh so uh, it, what this this hypotenuse this is one if this is one uh the the thickness of the atmosphere is one unit then the this hypotenuse is 1 over cosine of z okay uh, which is also known as secant of z right that is the uh, amount of uh, air that uh we are passing through at a uh, zenithal distance of z now even though we call this a distance remember it's an angle uh, right uh, all distances on the sphere are angles this uh, this will keep coming up uh so so we define this thing called air mass which is the number of atmosphere length or the fraction of atmosphere length that your light is traveling through and it is given by secant of z now this is i am just throwing it in here because it's something useful to calculate uh, this is why we like to do observations when the star is right at the zenith or object is right at the zenith or as close to the zenith as possible uh, this is a way to approximate how much the effect of the atmosphere is going to uh, bother your observation right um, so uh, that's just a uh, aside um but this is the calculation that actually affects the positions of stars the previous calculation is uh, just to know how thick the atmosphere is that because it's just an easy calculation and we have defined all the terms so i threw that in there now atmospheric reflection uh, is caused by a refraction of light through the air in the atmosphere and it causes the objects to appear higher than they actually are so you might have heard this as the sun has already set but we still see the sun because of atmospheric refraction uh and there's also another effect which is the sun looks uh, like a flat ellipsoid right uh, because of the uh, atmospheric refraction uh what is happening is remember that a light bends towards the normal whenever it enters a denser medium uh and as it enters layers or layers of air coming towards you the light from the star uh bends more and more towards the normal so therefore uh if the light is coming like this from the star uh, along this white ray it will bend downwards like that and so the position of the star that you actually see is higher in altitude so although this this was the altitude of the star uh, you actually see this altitude okay so um that's the effect of atmospheric refraction uh it increases the apparent altitude so we are going to use this h sub a for apparent altitude h subscript a and h is our actual altitude okay so there is a formula for this calculation uh, god knows where this formula comes from it's a, it's an empirical formula which means somebody did a bunch of measurements and then fit a curve to it uh so uh, uh it it accounts it, it depends the correction depends on the pressure of the atmosphere uh the temperature of the atmosphere now you know that the temperature and air pressure of the atmosphere are not actually constant uh but we are just going to assume that they are constant and uh, uh put some numbers there and uh then there is this formula that uh, involves the cotangent 1 over tangent uh and when using this formula you have to substitute the altitude in degrees uh not any other units uh so if you are putting this in a computer you have to first substitute the altitude in degrees calculate this 
fraction and sum and all of that, and then convert to radians and uh, run the tangent function. Uh, so this this entire argument of this should be interpreted as being in degrees. It, this, these are the headaches that come with uh, you know a formula that uh, has been curve fit. So there's no rhyme or reason why, uh, but this is the procedure to follow. Um, here you substitute the temperature in degrees Celsius, and here you substitute the atmosphere in uh, atmospheric pressure in kilopascals. Uh, now, uh, if you don't care about these variations, you can just set this entire factor to one. And then you will get something for standard atmosphere at 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if you want to be detailed, you can always put in these factors. Uh, so, for example, you can derive this pressure from a model of how pressure varies with altitude so that when you are on top of a mountain, you calculate the atmospheric refraction correctly. So this is something that we put, put into software, uh, but uh, it's kind of, uh, I, I don't know whether it actually works. These are uh, very rough formulae. So like I said, H must be in degrees. The argument or tangent should be uh, uh, interpreted as being in degrees. Uh, the correction though, this correction is obtained in arc minutes and it's an additive correction. So when you calculate the correction app through this formula, you have to divide it by 60 because this is in arc minutes and you want to convert it into degrees and then add it to the existing altitude to get the apparent altitude in degrees. Now, uh, there is no explanation for this formula. It's just uh, uh, an empirical formula. We'll see a lot of these formulas without any explanation uh, throughout these talks. Uh, please just take them at face value. Uh, but. But yeah, so uh, this is uh, this is how we calculate atmospheric refraction. Now, this formula gives you, if you know the actual altitude of the star, it gives you the apparent altitude. Okay, so the correction is always positive because the you know the location of the star, the altitude of the star increases like we just described. Uh, the opposite formula is also available, uh, and. <laughs> Another thing to note is that uh, the formulas are only approximately inverses of each other. So if they are not exact inverses, uh, because they are empirical formulas. Uh, in fact, this caused a bug in case stars long ago <laughs> that we that we fixed uh, by actually solving the equation to get the exact inverse. Uh, anyway, those were, those are side stories. Uh, but the the formula has similar form. Okay, it again has the cotangent. It again has this pressure and temperature term. But now these numbers are different, and you are uh, you are substituting the apparent altitude into the formula, not the actual altitude. Uh, and you plug it into the formula, and you get the correction in arc minutes again. But you subtract the correction from the apparent, so it's a it's a, a subtractive correction, and then you get the actual altitude. Remember, this is apparent, and this is actual. So if so what this formula gives you is if you see a star at 30 degrees, it's probably actually at 29.5 degrees or whatever, and you can calculate that through this uh, formula. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, this is kind of self-contained material. We won't visit this again, uh, but just another correction to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, so. Before I go into this material, any quick questions about uh, uh, about uh, what we just discussed, air mass and atmospheric refraction? Uh, yes, Akash, there, are, there is one question. So for a visual observer, how important is it to correct for uh, atmospheric refraction? That's a very good question. So normally for a visual observer, you are uh, observing high in the sky. You are trying to avoid looking down uh, because of the high air mass, right? You are not uh, trying to, you are trying to avoid looking below, let's say 45 degrees. So you rarely need this, but sometimes you have to look, uh, you know, let's say you are looking at a Southern object. Uh, the Southern object might only have its culmination at uh, 10 degrees. Uh, that is its highest point in the in the night sky will from your latitude it might just be 10 degrees then what do you do you are looking down in the dirt as uh, my friends call it uh, so at that point yes this correction can be as big as half a degree or one degree close to the uh, close to the horizon this correction is significant 
so that's when that's right. when it really matters yeah so there is a follow up question similar on the similar line so uh, when we are looking at the sun it is not actually at the apparent uh, position uh, due to uh, atmospheric refraction right the uh, uh, the sun the sun is an extended object right so it is a little hard to explain the sun gets compressed in the vertical direction right it uh, it, it gets uh, stretched it appears not like a circle but like an ellipse uh so the center of the sun yes does shift up because of atmospheric refraction and uh, that's only near the horizon all of this correction matters maybe like 5 to 10 degrees above the horizon that's when it starts becoming significant for 0 to 10 degrees in the, if you are looking below 10 degrees altitude then these corrections are all going to become significant Uh, is there a way to measure? Uh, Sunil has asked the question: How to measure those in degrees, or uh, should we simply imagine? Uh, so, I think the only way to measure this would be to take a star that is, uh, let's say, on the equator or something like that, that actually rises to a good height. So then you calculate where it should be uh, from from the. Uh, from the coordinates that you saw let's say you saw the star at uh, 30 degrees altitude so you mark it and say at this time i saw it on this uh, you if, especially if you take a star on the celestial equator and and then you can time it saying this is so you know its altitude as a function of time and then you actually observe it and then calculate the difference i think this is how these formulas were derived people have actually measured this and that's how they have fit this curve to it so I, i i think you can i i i got these formulas from wikipedia actually because they are better explained on wikipedia than in my reference uh so if you if you look there i think it also has the uh, experimental study i think it uh, comes from a paper that you can look at okay uh, there is one more question there is one more question there is one more question is it why a uh, guide scope and guide ring camera becomes uh, more important uh, i don't think so uh, akash i don't think so i think yeah. guide scope and guiding camera becomes important mostly because of uh, your mount having variation in the one gear and so on and so forth i think astrophotographers can correct me if i'm wrong but uh, see a, a good piece of software should take this into account right yeah uh, that's it's all possible. it's possible that that's why you actually need to plate solve near the horizon or whatever right but this this effect is uh, significant there but also how much time do you spend at the horizon right so it's uh, in that sense uh, you only photograph what arrives high up so in some sense this effect is uh, if is not very important but it is significant so k stars uh, k stars can simulate this maybe if the, at the end if we have time i'll turn it on and off and show you what happens i'll just write that down thank you any other questions uh yeah uh, that's all uh, no more no other uh, significant questions here yeah. okay Cool. So now we are going to introduce. Uh, so we were we introduced the coordinate system that is natural when you go out and look at the sky, right? Uh, but that is that that coordinate system, the altazimuth system, varies from every observer's uh, position. It varies with time, and it varies oddly enough because of the atmospheric refraction. So it's a it's a it's not a standard coordinate system in that sense because it is it the altitude of a star changes with time the azimuth of a star changes with time it also changes with where you are on the earth so what we want to do is go imagine that we are flying in space and looking at the sky we want something like that uh so now let's imagine that we are flying in space and looking at the earth from far away okay and the solar system the earth here is orbiting the sun in a plane okay uh, this comes from kepler's third law if you like uh, you know actually these orbits are not exact planes or anything they will precess but uh, we won't 
bother ourselves with all of that for as far as we are concerned uh, the earth orbit the sun in a plane and that plane is called the ecliptic plane okay uh, i don't know why it has the name ecliptic probably because eclipses happen there or something like that uh, but uh, as far as we are concerned it's the uh, it's the plane of the solar system so the earth's orbit lies in this plane um but we all know i hope that the earth's axis is tilted from it's not perpendicular to this plane the earth does not rotate perpendicular to this plane instead the earth's axis is tilted and this number is up approximately 23 and a half degrees apparently this also varies it's not always constant 23 and a half degrees there is some variation in this and we will not even think about that variation right uh, as you as you try to correct for more and more things this subject gets very very complicated so we are trying to simplify it we only have to deal with three rotation three motions uh, two of which we already know uh, rotation and revolution the third one is called precession and we'll introduce it later so uh, so this is the plane of revolution and this is the axis of rotation and they are offset by 23 and a half degrees right this is why we know the season sucker uh because different uh the the, the angle of sun rays uh, that hits a particular location changes uh th this is why the circles tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn are important they are at 23 and a half degrees uh uh circles latitude circles uh similarly this is why we um the circles uh, arctic circle and antarctic circles are important they are the complementary angle of 23 and a half degrees 66 and a half or whatever uh this is also why we have this notion of uh, uttarayana or dakshinayana in uh, indian astronomy which is uh, the northward and southward movement of the earth sun in the in the sky and this is also why the you know uh, the the so the apparent solar day that equation of time thing the sundial time is not exactly the same as the time we measure in the day uh, this is the thing that we discussed in the beginning now all of these effects come from this 23 and a half degree tilt uh, so this 23 and a half degree tilt is extremely important uh so again if i zoom in on this region in this orbit then this is roughly what i'm seeing uh funnily enough i i chose the uh, chose to mirror image it sorry about that like uh, the tilt is now shown this way uh anyway um uh, this is the axis of rotation of the earth which is tilted 23 and a half degrees from the perpendicular to the plane of uh revolution of the earth so the horizontal plane is the plane of the solar system or the plane of earth's orbit and the celestial equator is tilted from that line at 23 and a half degrees now when this ecliptic plane cuts the celestial sphere it creates a line right uh, it creates a great circle because this uh, ecliptic plane is passing through the center of the earth uh, when it cuts the celestial this imaginary celestial sphere it will create a great circle that great circle is called ecliptic oh i should mention this most solar system objects except comets comets lie more or less on this plane okay uh, so let's view the next slide where Oh, what was that? Okay, yeah, where these two are shown. Sorry for my bad diagram. Uh, let's see if I can quickly fix my diagram. Oh, never mind. Okay. Uh, uh, no, sorry, I have an urge to fix this diagram, so I will, I will fix it slightly. Yeah, that, that's better. Uh, both of these circles pass through the center of the Earth. They are great circles. Uh, here is the celestial equator, and here is the ecliptic. and the celestial equator is perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the earth right uh, this is the extension of earth's rotation axis the uh, the the polar axis and the celestial equator is perpendicular to that the ecliptic plane is tilted from that at 23 and a half degrees this is clear so then there are two points where these two circle meet circles meet okay they are marked in orange uh, this should lie uh, you yeah, okay actually, actually it's correct they are opposite diametrically opposite points and they are they, sh they lie at these intersections these two points are called the equinoxes okay uh, they are not the ascending node and descending node uh, but uh, th these are the these are equinoxes they are different um 
so one of them is called the spring equinox the other is called the fall equinox the technical terms are vernal equinox and autumnal equinox uh so when the sun is at these two points the length of day and night are equal and those are the you know vernal equinox and uh, depending on the one that comes in march is called vernal equinox and the, when the sun is in the other one in uh, september that's called the autumnal equinox the two points where there is this maximum separation between these two circles uh, are called the solstices one of them is the summer solstice the other is the winter solstice okay when the sun is at those points we call them uh, solstices now the sun has seen from the earth marches along the ecliptic not along the celestial equator the sun marches along the ecliptic and uh, so the sun takes this green line and it ends up here then it is maximally south in the sky that is the dakshinayana okay and when it comes maximally north here that is called uttarayana that's uh, that's the cycle of north south motion of the sun in the sky okay and uh, uh yeah uh, so that's uh that's the equinoxes and the solstices uh like i said earlier uh, one of them is called the vernal equinox and uh, autumnal the other is autumnal equinox and when the sun is at these points the day and night are equal length now why are the day and night the equal length uh let me see if i can make a quick explanation of that i won't explain it very well uh, because this is kind of off topic for me now uh the rotation of the earth happens along the celestial equator okay uh, so the celestial equator is a great circle okay if some if a, if something on is at this point it will rotate on a non great circle that corresponds to uh, the the line of uh the uh, that corresponds to this almost like a latitude line through that point technically it's a declination circle uh and that line that great that circle is not a great circle it will not be cut in your uh, cut by the horizon in half whereas the celestial equator will be cut by horizon in half because it's a great circle and uh that's why uh depending on whether you are in the northern hemisphere or in the southern hemisphere uh any day other than the equinox the uh, the sun might be e- in the in the sky for greater than half a day or less than half a day so that's uh, that's a rough explanation we'll come back to this topic later if necessary uh, but the equinoxes are the points where the sun uh, if the sun is present at those equinoxes the length of the night and day is equal okay uh finally we'll now uh actually this is like penultimate topic there are two more topics uh let's introduce equatorial coordinates this is the coordinate system that is normally found in your catalogs up to an effect that we call precession that we'll come to later for all practical purposes now this is the coordinate system for which that is fixed approximately to the sky and remember i need two reference points to define a coordinate system the two references are the celestial equator and the vernal equinox for this coordinate system uh i'll explain this better in a moment but uh let's go back to this diagram that uh, says how we define a coordinate system uh then here the any point along the equator has declination i'm going to use the symbol delta for declination uh it has declination zero all points along the celestial equator have declination zero so the declination coordinate goes perpendicular to uh to the celestial equator it's like up down but it's not exactly up down okay it goes north south so declination is the north south coordinate and it roughly behaves like latitude okay uh and the right right ascension is the name of the other uh, coordinate that increases along the celestial equator and uh that is roughly like no- longitude it's the east west coordinate okay declination goes between minus 90 remember there is one angle that goes between minus 90 and 90 and there is one angle that goes between 0 to 360 uh the declination goes from minus 90 to 90 and uh, a right ascension which i denote by alpha goes between uh, 0 and 360 degrees 
okay uh, the zero of right ascension is defined at this point vernal equinox okay vernal equinox is also called first point of aries and uh, we use the symbol gamma this symbol to denote the first point of aries or the vernal equinox uh and the north celestial pole has delta equals plus 90 degrees and the south celestial pole has delta equals minus 90 degrees the equator has delta zero like we described uh because it's the north south coordinate and uh, again as just like before alpha is undefined here at the celestial poles uh, you can have any right ascension at the celestial poles it's undefined okay so uh this might not be very clear yet but consider this picture okay uh so the blue lines here are the latitude and longitude lines on earth just imagine projecting them onto the celestial sphere just like we projected the celestial uh, equator to form the celestial equator if you project the latitude lines onto the celestial sphere then we get the lines of declination so the lines of fixed declination are not great circles this will become important in a moment so see here's the line of fixed declination let's say 30 degrees that's uh that's uh, not a great circle whereas line of declination equal to 0 is the only great circle which is the celestial equator uh whereas all the all the lines of constant right ascension which are just like longitudes are uh, are uh, semi circles or uh, semi great circles if i may call it that a half of great circles uh so this is so the yellow what i've shown in yellow are the lines of constant declination and the lines of constant right ascension they are circles of uh constant declination and semi circles of constant right ascension okay so the important difference between longitude and right ascension is this longitude of a point on earth does not change similarly right ascension of a specific star approximately does not change okay but as the earth rotates which longitude corresponds to which right ascension that changes so for example at at some point the prime meridian on earth 0 degrees might align with right ascension of 10 hours normally the right ascension is measured in hours uh, just by convention okay uh, by 10 hours may we, we mean 150 degrees right uh, so let's say at some point the right ascension the longitude of 0 degrees is aligned with uh, the right ascension of 10 hours then one hour later the longitude of 0 degrees or will be actually aligned with the right ascension of 11 hours okay so uh, that that changes uh, so in other words the latitudes and longitudes are fixed to the earth and rotate with it the right ascension and declination are approximately fixed to the sky and do not rotate with the earth's rotation right and this ra dex grid remains approximately fixed in space by approximately we mean that there is a variation that variation takes is noticeable over tens of years it's not noticeable over short term and that's an effect called precession and we'll talk about it okay uh and the right ascension increases in the direction of earth's rotation so as the earth rotates the uh, the right ascension numbers that are overhead will keep increasing okay it passes through higher and higher right ascension so right ascension is normally shortened to ra so you might hear people say ra and dec dec is short for declination so you hear this term ra and dec a lot in astronomy uh okay i hope this is clear uh, because this is important uh, so let me pause and ask if there are any questions are there any questions Uh, i don't see any new questions uh, perhaps members okay. can unmute and ask if they have sure okay uh, so i'll wait for uh, 15 more seconds and see if someone unmutes
Okay, I guess there are no questions. Uh, let me just quickly summarize this. Uh, there is something called the, the, the plane of the solar system projected onto the celestial sphere is called the ecliptic. It forms a great circle. That great circle is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, which is the axial tilt of the Earth. Uh, it's tilted at 23 and a half degrees from the celestial equator. Uh, the points where the ecliptic intersects with the celestial equator are called the equinoxes. And there is a coordinate system called uh, equatorial coordinates, which is based on longitude and long, uh, latitude. The zero of this coordinate called right ascension, which behaves like longitude, that coordinate is zero at the vernal equinox and increases in the direction of rotation of Earth. Okay. And uh, the other coordinate called declination is the north south coordinate. It's just like a latitude coordinate. And uh, it is 90 degrees at the north celestial pole and minus 90 degrees at the south celestial pole. The circles of constant declination are not great circles. They are just like circles of latitude. The circles of the semicircles of constant uh, right ascension are halves of, uh, halves of great circles, just like longitudes. The only difference between longitudes and right ascension is longitudes rotate with the Earth. As the Earth rotates, your longitude remains fixed. Uh, but as the Earth rotates, the, uh, the right ascension it, that is overhead keeps changing. Right, so we have uh, discussed that. So the right ascension declination is roughly fixed to the star. Okay, now this is another important concept. Uh, this is called local sidereal time. Uh, we'll explain the word sidereal, we'll explain the word local later. But for now, the local sidereal time is the right ascension that currently coincides with the longitude of the observer. So let's say at this instant, the RA that coincides with your longitude on Earth is 15 degrees and 31 minutes, then, uh, sorry, 15 hours and 31 minutes, then that is your local sidereal time. So, so we call the particular line of RA that coincides with your longitude, we call that the meridian. This is a term that you have heard so many times in this talk. What that is, is this, this is, imagine projecting your longitude into the celestial sphere, that uh, semicircle, is called the meridian. And the RA of the meridian is what we call as the local sidereal time. So this is the RA on the meridian. Okay. Uh, so we abbreviate it to LST. Here's an illustration. This blue line is the observer's longitude. The corresponding RA line in the celestial sphere is called LST. And this changes with time. It roughly changes like regular clock, okay? but there is a slight difference. Okay, so now we will explain what the sidereal time means. Okay. Uh, so I, I, how, how much does an LST change in a day? The answer is, the L is while, while the local solar time or local so mean time changes by 24 hours in a day, the local sidereal time actually changes by a little more than 24 hours in a day. Okay, and I'll explain why. Uh, this, this, uh, so imagine, uh, uh, let's call this the sidereal clock. This sidereal clock follows the Earth's position with respect to the star, not with respect to the sun. Now, let's imagine there is a, a fake planet, this doesn't exist. This planet revolves 90 degrees for each rotation. I've just exaggerated it so, so, that, uh, so that it's more clear. So every time this planet uh, rotates 90 degrees, it revolves, that means it goes around the sun. By, uh, sorry, every time it rotates 360 degrees, it revolves 90 degrees. Okay, this is the exaggerated planet that I'm considering. So this flag shows that it has gone through, like the flag has gone there, the flag has gone there, and finally, it has rotated by 360 degrees, so the flag is aligned with where we started. But you see, here the flag was aligned with the sun. In this case, even though the Earth has rotated 360 degrees with respect to the distant stars, the flag is not aligned with the sun. So initially, the flag was aligned both with the distant star and the sun. Here, the flag is aligned with the distant star. So that means the distant star has gone through one circle and come back to the same position in the sky, right? So the, the star has gone, as the Earth has 
or as this planet has rotated all this way the star has completed one full cycle but the sun on the other hand is has not completed one full cycle you see the sun is still in some different angle when the planet rotates this extra amount now the sun has come back to the same angle so this means that a day as defined by the sun and a day as defined by the stars is different okay so as the earth rotates first the stars come back to the same position and then the sun comes back to the same position so this means if we define one sidereal day one sidereal day sidereal means star in some language greek i guess if we define one sidereal day as the time for the star to come back to the same position same uh, position in the sky then one sidereal day is less than one day is that clear because for one day you have to do this extra rotation that extra rotation doesn't happen for one sidereal day okay so the stars come back to the same position after the exact number for us for uh, rough number for us is 23 hours and 56 minutes okay whereas the sun comes back every 24 hours roughly i mean we already said that there's a lot of variation in how the sun comes back but uh, uh yeah uh, roughly 24 hours whereas this is roughly 23 hours and 56 minutes so uh let me explain why it is 23 hours and 56 uh, minutes so like we said one mean solar day is 24 hours that is not a 360 degree of rotation of earth with respect to the stars it is actually a 360 degree rotation of the uh, earth in space as seen against the stars plus this extra rotation to face the sun because of the revolution and this extra rotation depends on the revolution of the earth right how much the earth has moved in its orbit the earth we know moves 360 degrees in 365 days okay which earlier also we approximated to 1 degree so the earth moves maybe one extra degree uh, every day the revolution of the earth okay does it make sense so so for for the earth to face the sun again in the same position for the same point on the earth to face the sun again the earth has to actually rotate 361 days uh, sorry 361 degrees okay so that means the sidereal day is actually 24 hours this 361 degrees is what we call as 24 hours so the sidereal day is actually 24 hours minus this 1 degree that extra rotation right it's just 360 degrees as seen from space okay so that is remember 1 degree is 4 minutes remember that thumb rule okay so that means this is 24 hours minus 4 minutes so the sidereal day is actually 4 minutes shorter okay uh so more accurately the, ex the exact number again i got this from wikipedia is uh, is this number here 23 hours 56 minutes and 4.0905 seconds so this is the this is the exact length of the sidereal day or in other words it's 86164.1 seconds it's not 80000 it's not 86400 seconds which is the regular day it is 86164.1 seconds so every second of time remember the local sidereal time is just tracking the sidereal clock is tracking the positions of the uh, stars uh, so every second of time actually corresponds to 1.0027 whatever second change in lst so the lst increases slightly more every second than uh, than the regular time and this is what changes the constellations right every so for example because of this accumulated for for uh, uh four minutes every day that is what makes the next zodiacal constellation come after a month remember at the very beginning of the talk we said something about how uh one month is two hours change in ra that's exactly what's going on here one month is two hours change in sidereal time because of this accumulated four minutes uh, every day that's why one month will produce two hours of change in lst okay uh final 
two slides. Uh, the, I guess this is the final concept pretty much. Uh, we define something called our angle, which is just defined to be local sidereal time minus alpha. It's a way of measuring how far the array of some object is from the local sidereal time. So let us say this is an object. This is the a line. This is the RA circle on which it is. Okay, remember RA semicircle rather, on which it is. Uh, and this is your meridian. So the, the RA on the meridian is the local sidereal time. And this difference is what we call the hour angle of the object. Okay. So if an object has not yet transited the meridian, that is, it's still rising in the east, it will have a negative hour angle. If an object is past the meridian, so it has already transited and is, it's setting in the west, then it has a positive hour angle. And the hour angle roughly tells you how many hours uh, it will take for the object to come to meridian. You know why I use the word roughly now? Because the actual time is sidereal time, whereas this hour angle actually counts in one degree equals, uh, sorry, 15 degrees equals one hour. That's why it's, it's roughly. But, uh, so if an, uh, but this is a good enough approximation for short periods of time. So if the hour angle of an object is minus three hours, then it'll, it'll come to the meridian uh, slightly before three hours uh, from now, right? Uh, so uh, the hour angle of an object changes with time. Its RA does not change with time. Okay? So this is to be noted. Why do I have to define this? Because this hour angle will come in a formula later. So, uh, oh, also, the horizon, eastern horizon has minus six hour, hour angle because six hours later that object will be on your meridian, uh, whereas the western horizon has plus six hour angle. Uh, now, also, I should, I, I should remind, just to be very clear, uh, it will not actually take six hours. It will take six hours. Uh, it will take five hours and uh, 58 minutes, right? So uh, that's because of the change b between sidereal time and uh, uh, solar time. OK, finally, we are ready to describe how stars move in the sky. Stars follow circles of fixed declination as the Earth rotates, right? Uh, because their RA changes or their hour angle changes, their RA does not change. Uh, the the uh, hour angle of the star changes, uh, and they but the declination does not change. Uh, so they follow circles of fixed declination in the sky. So the easiest example is pole star lies is the point of declination 90 degrees. It never moves. Things that are very close to the pole star go in these circumpolar orbits, right? They go uh, they go on these short uh, orbits around the uh, uh, pole. Um, and they never rise or set. Whereas, uh, whereas things that go below, like uh, there's one more great circle here, I guess. Uh, sorry, one more declination circle, not a great circle here, like that. And that object does set here, uh, here and rise over there. Uh, so uh, here is some more mathematics, uh, and. This is basically a star on the equator actually moves one degrees in four minutes. Well, one degree in 3.99 minutes, but you get the point. One degree in four minutes. Uh, a star at declination delta actually moves slower, okay, because it has to, or it moves less because it has to traverse a smaller circle in the same amount of time. So it actually moves one degree times cosine of delta in four minutes. So that's why when you measure the FOV of your eyepiece, you should always pick a star on the celestial equator because the stars closer to the pole are going to move so more slowly. Uh, now, that should not confuse you with the 360 degrees it rotates around the North Pole. What we are measuring here is the angular length of this. Uh, so imagine the length of this circle, but divided by the radius, this undefined radius of the celestial sphere. So in some sense, this entire thing can be measured as an angle. Uh, the length of the, the circumference of the circle is some angle, and that is not 360 degrees. It's 360 degrees times cosine of delta because this circle is smaller. Okay, if that concept is not very clear. Think about it a little more uh, at home, and we will touch upon it a little more uh, in the next session. So uh, that's everything I have for today. Uh, let me uh, stop here and ask uh, if there are any questions.
Uh, Akash? Yes. Um, uh, yes, Akash, there were two questions. So one was from yeah. Sri on the previous topic. So does the precision of Equinix have any effect on the seasons? Uh, good question. Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that. I think the answer is no. And the reason is, uh, it would normally drift the seasons, but we have already, already accounted for that in the definition of the year. Okay, so by changing the definition of our year uh, to what is called the tropical year, the dates of the equinoxes will continue to be the same. That's my understanding. I could be wrong on this, but uh, most likely that's what it is. Uh, so it will not have any effect on the seasons because we have already accounted for it in how we measure the seasons. Okay. Uh, Deepak wants to know uh, about the books you refer to cover these topics. Okay, the books I refer to to cover these topics. Um, let me uh, let me bring up the browser here. One moment. Uh, I know you still can't see it, but uh, so. Let me change the way I share my screen. Stop presenting. Presenting uh, a window. Wait, what is this? Let's just do entire screen. OK. Uh, can you see this Amazon window? Can you see this Amazon book? OK. So this is the book I refer to. It's actually not this. This price is ridiculous. Uh, I don't know why this is the price shown. It's still very expensive, though, because it's a hard browned uh, US print. There is no Indian edition. So uh, but this is the book I've been referring to. It costed me around forty five dollars. Directly from a publisher. The, like I said, the problem with this book is it's written from a very computational standpoint. He doesn't actually explain to you the concepts very well. So I had to do a lot of digging through Wikipedia. And <laughs> also, I took a class with Shailaja, Dr. Shailaja at the uh, Bangalore Planetarium. You know, uh, he teaches astronomy to REAP students. And uh, that's where I actually learned this stuff. So there's a little bit of my REAP lectures, a little bit of this book. And a little bit of playing around with JSTARS, and also a little bit of Wikipedia. So it's kind of uh, all over the place. But this book is the standard reference. Uh, Akash? Yes. Um, uh, if you don't mind, can you show me the, uh, the slide before the last slide? OK, let me, let me kill this for a moment. Hold on. Uh, Presenting. Uh, yes. Which slide did you want to see? Uh, the, uh, the one in, in which um, uh, you're talking about the uh, the hour angle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this this one. Mm, uh, yeah. Uh, so you were saying that there was some uh, discrepancy between um, uh, uh, b between the the hour angle. So um, because the the hour, the, the RA is in um, um, you, you said that's in um, uh, yes. in okay. mean solar time, and um, so it takes um, it takes less than uh, less yes. than hours for an object to reach the right. zenith. Uh, yeah, get, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you just explain why that happens? I didn't get that part. Okay. So, uh, in measuring angles, remember that by definition, one hour when we are referring to a measurement of an angle is fifteen degrees. That's by definition. Okay. Uh, that came from the measurement, like that was inspired, if you like, uh, by the measurement that one day is twenty-four hours, which means that. It'll uh, 24 hours of angle should pass in 24 hours of time. Okay, so that's where the uh, uh, 
one hour equals 15 degrees measurement was inspired. In reality, we know that that's not the case. Why? Because all the stars move based on the sidereal clock, right? So the stars are actually finishing one rotation, which is 24 hours of angle in 23 hours and 56 minutes. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so 24 hours of angle is covered by the star in 23 hours and 56 minutes. That means that six hours of angle, sorry, I, I miscalculated earlier. So six hours of angle is going to be covered in roughly five hours and 59 minutes. I said five hours and 58. That was a calculation mistake, right? Because I have to divide this four hours by four. So, uh, so six hours of angle will be covered by a star in five hours and 59 minutes. So that's why there is a difference. It's because the stars follow the sidereal time and not uh, the solar time. Whereas the, our angle measurement is based on the solar time. So that's why that's why I said in the beginning of the talk, when we say one hour of angle is 15 degrees, just take that as the definition of an hour. It has nothing to do with the actual amount of time. Oh, OK. Um, uh, it only oh. approximately has something to do with the actual amount of time. Right? And that difference is because of this uh, sidereal clock. Uh, okay, isn't it possible to uh, define the right ascension in uh, sidereal uh, based on sidereal clock as well? That is how it is defined. The, remember, the right ascension on your uh, meridian is equal to your local sidereal time. Oh, so okay. the the RA system rotates at the sidereal rate. The coordinate system does not rotate once in twenty four hours; it rotates once in twenty three hours and fifty six minutes. Okay. I think this is the most uh, the tough and most important concept, unfortunately, in, the, in this talk. Is this idea that there's a local sidereal time, it changes once in 23 hours and 56 minutes. Uh, just to tell an interesting story, this is how radio astronomy was discovered, right? Uh, uh, apparently, these engineers were, uh, uh, were looking, were trying to find noise sources for their. Uh, uh, for radio communication. So they had no idea that celestial objects emit ra uh, radio waves. They were just trying to measure uh, what is the background noise. And they saw this weird noise that kept coming back every 23 hours and 56 minutes. And they didn't know what this noise was that had this weird 23 hours, 56 minute cycle. And apparently an astronomer said, oh, that's exactly the sidereal, uh, sidereal day. And that's when they realized that what they were seeing were the radio emissions from the Milky Way. So every time the Milky Way was high up, they would their radio telescope or the radio receiver would uh, pick up the Milky Way, and that's what uh, they were seeing. So this sidereal time, 23 hours, 56 minutes, uh, kind of led to the discovery of radio astronomy. Uh, yeah. So just before you mentioned it was the Milky Way, I was under the impression that uh, the object which they have been observing was the Sun, but because uh, because the Sun mm, would take. Um, uh, if I'm correct, exactly uh, 24 hours because that's the mean solar day. Absolutely. So, yes, yeah, so, so that object cannot be that's the sun. So it has to be the Milky Way, the center of the Milky yes, Way. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, so they were looking at the Milky Way. Uh, and uh, they were, yeah, they, I think they already knew that the sun was a source of radio. So, but uh, they didn't know about the Milky Way. And that's why that's exactly right. So, the, the sun will either, will, will almost always do 24 hours plus or minus quarter um, minute is what I read on the internet. So you can look at the article on apparent solar time. Uh, they have a table telling you how the uh, variation of the length of the day changes uh, it, near the equinox and uh, near the solstices. So, but you're right, it will be much closer to 24 hours. So they will, that's how they knew it was not the sun. And the, it was from the Milky Way, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, this is about the local uh, sidereal time uh, which we're yes. talking about. So for observers during an observation uh, session, uh, how is the local sidereal time uh, important? Like I'd imagine that supposing uh, uh, supposing I know the local sidereal time, uh, which is um, which is uh, exactly the, the right ascension of the meridian um, or uh, the right ascension of uh, the yeah the um, the right essential uh, uh, ascension which is directly uh, overhead. Yeah, uh, correct. So, so 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 that way, even without looking at the sky, 
um, uh, I'd be able to know uh, what I can see. So just based on the, on the on the local side real time, I can plan an observing session. That's correct. Yes. Uh, up to some up to some caveats. Okay, I'll ignore the caveats for now. Uh, uh, but uh, yes, one way I use the local side real time all the always is I look at the LST. Uh, let's say the LST is 16 hours and 15 minutes, and then an object's LST is uh, is let's say 16 hours and uh, 45 minutes. Then I know that if I wait roughly half an hour, that object will be higher up, so I can get a better observation of it. So you want to observe objects whose RA is close to your local sidereal time, right? Because that's when they are on the meridian. That's the highest point. So your hour angle. Uh, or your LST minus RA will will tell you how much time is left or how much time has passed since it's uh, passed the meridian. So that way it's very helpful. Uh, the other way I use it is right now, let's say the LST is 16 hours, then I know that something with eight hours is under the horizon, so I can't observe it. Um, so you're right. It tells you what you can observe and what you cannot observe. The caveat here is, remember that things around the North Pole are circumpolar. Right. So if you are if you are if you are at the equator, if, if your observing site is right at the celestial equator, yes, you can hundred percent use this to tell what is visible and what is not visible. But if you are at let's say you are at uh, thirty degrees north latitude, then remember that the pole star is always visible, uh, even though its uh, right ascension changes slightly, uh, or sorry, its LST changes over the course of a day. So it has a slight uh, offset from the pole. Right. Uh, similarly. Uh, objects that are circumpolar, like uh, Artha Minor in most places, Artha Minor will be visible all through the night because it's just going to rotate around the pole. So irrespective of what the LST is and what the RA is, those uh, stars near the pole will always be visible. And that's the that's the catch. But otherwise, you're right. You can just use this to figure out what's visible and what's not visible. Uh, and I think this answers another uh, question which I've uh, been having for a long time, and uh, that's why is it that the um, uh, that the right ascension is um, is presented uh, in hours and not degrees. Correct. Uh, the right ascension is precisely presented in hours because it has this notion of time, except you have to be careful that it's approximate because of the difference between the sidereal clock and the uh, and the real uh, and the solar clock. But because 23 hours and 56 minutes is approximately 24 hours, these uh, right ascension values in hours actually uh, actually make a difference, uh, actually have some meaning, right? So it's, uh, that's exactly right. That's why we measure right ascension in hours. Uh, okay, Similarly, anyway, so in the, yeah, yeah, in anyway, the case of right first. ascension and... Uh... Sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, 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 yeah, I just want to say uh, say a big thank you here because uh, I think I learned something new and uh, something very um, useful from this uh, discussion. I never knew about uh, ab about the hour angle and uh, the local sidereal time, but I think I can I can use this uh, the next time I go to observe. So thank you for that. Sure, that's awesome. I mean, uh, next session I will actually show all the formulas that are required to uh, go through all of the calculations. This time it was all concepts. Uh, so if you if you're going to be available for that, that's uh, something we can that, that's something to look forward to. Otherwise, this is already a lot of helpful information for observation. I I use these for rough estimates every now and then when I'm observing. Uh, okay. So anyway, I'm done. There, others can ask their questions. Okay. So uh, when we are talking about angles in RA and our angle, we are actually so uh, even though they are uh, in uh, in hours, these hours actually correspond to the angle and not the time. That's what you meant. Correct. When exactly. You said, That's uh, what I meant. Uh, yes, absolutely. They would correspond exactly to hours if we if we didn't have this difference between solar day and sidereal day. But uh, yes, that's why one hour is a measurement of angle that is equal to fifteen degrees. It's not. It's uh, yeah. It's only roughly has something to do with time. Okay, uh, we have uh, exceeded the time with almost by 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, I, I realized that. <laughs> I'll wind up the session here. Okay.
uh, and uh, off uh, off on the internet. Uh, do tell me if you are uh, interested in a session where we just look at uh, a sky map planetarium software and explore these concepts. I can do one of those. Otherwise, I can just get into the calculations and we can keep that for the end. So we'll coordinate back on the WhatsApp group and other places. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the session. I understand it's a lot of material. And if it's uh, not clear, please uh, feel free to revisit these slides. I'm going to share the slides. Uh, and uh, please discuss any questions, because these are all prerequisite material for our next session. Unlike last time, the sessions are not independent. This time, you actually need this to uh, be able to understand what we are doing with the calculations. So, okay, thank you.